Okay, we're on page 932. <clears throat> um, the just, just before we get going on the, on the, the, la the last bit of the Pasha, um, there is, so I wanted to talk about it yesterday, I, for I forgot to mention it, but there's a, a very interesting idea. You know that the, the, uh, the Torah spends a lot of time, right, if we go back to 928, to, you don't have to go back, I mean just, you know, verse-wise, we're going from verse number 9 all the way through to the end of the chapter in verse number 34. Right, so we're talking about 20, you know, 25 verses worth of talking about people that are really not such great tzaddikim, right? Uh, you know, people that killed inadvertently, manslaughter, that kind of stuff. We spoke about yesterday the idea of the, the spiritual level of the Jewish people, you know, reflecting what people can and cannot do. Right? So if the spiritual level of the Jewish people was higher, then this person wouldn't have been able to commit manslaughter because it... it he would have been a little bit more in tune, a little bit more... You know, there's an interesting thing that there's... there's, there's for example, in mitzvah observance, there are, there are three different levels of sinning, I guess. I'm going to use the word sinning in inverted commas. There's what's called mazed, when a person knows perfectly well that they're not supposed to do it, and they do it anyway. There's what's called shoigeg, which is an inadvertent sin. And then there's something called ones, which is completely beyond your control. control. Right, so for example, let's talk about, for example, putting on lights on Shabbos, right? So a mazid is somebody who knows perfectly well that he's not allowed to put the lights on on Shabbos, and he says, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway. A shoigeg is somebody who knows that he's not supposed to put the lights on on Shabbos, but he forgot that it was Shabbos. Like a momentary, you know, it, it happens, right? We, <clears throat> you put the lights on six days in the week, it's a, it's a natural, you know, it's just a natural reflex when you walk into the room that you flick the switch, and he forgot. And then there's an oinus. An oinus is that, I don't know, he never knew that he wasn't allowed to put the lights on to begin with. Right? So he can't be held accountable for what he's done. So an interesting idea. <clears throat> a person who does something, the maze, they do something on purpose. So obviously they get the full force of whatever the punishment is. Well, the person knows that he shouldn't be switching on the lights and shovels. He does it anyway. So that, you know, he's going to have to answer to God in the, the fullest form. Right? He doesn't really have a leg to stand on. The one who didn't have any idea whatsoever that it was forbidden to begin with, the Oines, so for him also, I mean, what's our Kodesh Baruch going to say to him? How come you put the lights on and Shabbos? He's going to say, well, I never knew. There's no, there's no case to answer. The one in the middle, the Shoigeg, so he forgot momentarily, whatever it was, whatever happened, he was aware of the problem and he, for, he momentarily forgot about it and he put the lights on. So that person is also going to have to give an accounting to God right, in order to explain why he did what he did, and there'll be some form of a punishment as well. So the, the, uh, the commentaries ask a very simple question. Why, why, if somebody has a momentary lapse, and they forget that it's Shabbos, and they put on the light, or they forget something, and they do something they shouldn't have done, so they ask, why, why would they be held account? Why is there some kind of a punishment to pay? Why is that different intrinsically from the person who never knew about it to begin with? So the answer is because these things are supposed to be ingrained inside of us. Which means that if I have a momentary lapse, it means that I, you know, I, I took my eye off the ball for a moment and then I did something that I should never have done. Actually, you know what, the idea that using, using a, that, you know, taking the sports analogy a little bit further, I think we can all, we can all relate to that, right? That the sportsman who takes his eye off the ball for a moment, so what happens? Either the other side scores a goal, or you miss the goal, whatever it is, right? But the, the repercussions of what you've done are going to be felt. Which means there has to be some kind of a spiritual, has to be some kind of a spiritual accounting for somebody who did something that they shouldn't have done, even though they can't be held accountable fully in the full sense of the word because there was some kind of a momentary lapse. And that's what's going on over here as well, which means that the spiritual levels of the Jewish people are such that we're, like I mentioned yesterday, we're all attached to each other. So if somebody is able to commit manslaughter, what that means really is that the person just above him obviously wasn't quite, you know, wasn't quite high enough spiritually. And the one above him wasn't quite high enough spiritually either. And, you know, up and up and up and up in order to pull the Jewish people up. So it's interesting that uh, the Bali Amusur, Asimcha Zissel Mikel, he says like this, that the Torah dedicates a lot of time, a lot of verses, to people who are not such great tzaddikim. Why is that? 
So it doesn't explain, but I, I, think, I think the answer is maybe twofold. I think, first of all, the Torah is dedicating a lot of verses to people who aren't such great tzaddik and they're not so righteous, right? In order to teach us, first of all, our responsibility to try to make people more righteous. So how do you make somebody more righteous? Not by going over and telling him and, and, and you know, dictating to him and, and, uh, and uh, you know, trying to control him, but rather by our becoming more careful ourselves for, for ourselves, that will have an impact on other people as well. I, I often <clears throat> tell everybody, you know, I've never come across, in all the years that I've been teaching here, I've never come, ac come across anybody who became orthodox because somebody threw a rock through their windscreen on Shabbos. You know, sometimes when cars go driving through orthodox neighborhoods, it does depend on what kind of neighborhood it is, but when they go through driving through certain orthodox neighborhoods, so, you know, sometimes they get, you know, pelted with stones. I've yet to come across anybody who became orthodox because their windshield was shattered by a stone on Shabbos. I've met plenty of people who became from because they were offered a bowl of cholent on Shabbos. Right? <laughs> That's for sure. Which means that the way, the way that we're going to have an impact on other people, the way that we're going to be able to show other people the beauty of what it is that we believe in is by believing in it ourselves. <laughs> the, the stronger our belief is, the more, the more beautiful we find it, the more majestic we treat it, then the greater the impact on other people is going to be. That, that's for sure, no? So I think that's the first reason. The first reason is that the Torah is coming to give us what's called a little bit of Musa, right? To try to teach us that if you want to have an impact, if you don't want people committing manslaughter, how can, how can we stop manslaughter? By our being more careful in our mitzvah observance. The more careful we are, the trickle-down effect. Again, it means that the person right below me is going to be affected and the person right below him will be affected until you get to the person who could have been able to commit manslaughter, but now he can't because everything's been raised up a little bit. Uh, hold on just one second. I think there's another reason as well, though. And I think the second reason perhaps is something which is maybe more significant in a certain way, which is that the Torah is coming to teach us that everybody, no, nobody's perfect. Right? Everybody's got inside of them, that Yetzirah that's causing them to behave in a way that they shouldn't behave and causing us to want to do things that we shouldn't want to do. And maybe the Torah is coming along to teach us that, you know, it's, it's, it's okay not to be perfect. It really is. We have to learn how to try to, you know, how to try to work on ourselves to fine-tune, to become a little bit better than we were. Of course we have to do that the whole time. But we also have to remember that perfection is something. Somebody, somebody once sent me an email with a signature line on the bottom which says, if you think you're perfect, then you're finished. And it's true. However, however you read it, right? It's true. If you've been put into this world in order to try to, to reach a certain level, if you think that you've reached perfection, then you have no function left here in this world at all. You're done. You're finished. Right? I mean, the, I think the simple understanding of the signature is that most people who think that they're perfect are insufferable. And... Uh, they're also finished, right? <laughs> That's difficult people to be around. But uh, the, idea of, the idea of working, you know, trying to reach a point. I, I heard once the most beautiful idea. I wish I could remember which Hasidic Rebbe said it. <clears throat> but Shlomo HaMelech writes, <laughs> We should educate each child according to who he is. And it's a very, very fundamental, you know, parenting thing that every child is different. It's something fascinating. You know, children come from the same space, same DNA, DNA pool. They've been brought up in the same environment. and yet Every kid is different. So Shloima, King Solomon says, Shloima Melech says, <laughs> Each child needs to be educated according to what that child is. According to who that child is. <clears throat> so one of the Hasidic Rebbe's once said like this, if you take a look in the way Chanoch is spelled Chet Nun Vav Chof. But when Shloimeh Melech wrote it, he wrote it without a vav. Chet nun chaf. It's missing a letter. I don't know if you realize just how absurd that really is, right? To write Chanoich, which is to educate, it's like writing education with a K. I mean, at least somebody realized that that was wrong. Everyone else seems to think that that's fine. But, you know, it's like, it's like writing education with a K. What do you mean Chanoich? You, you spell Chanoich wrong. You miss, out a, you miss out a letter on the way. So this Hasidish Rebbe said like this. He says that we have to understand that when it comes to chinuch, when it comes to education, everybody's deficient. Everybody's missing something. Somebody who thinks that he's not missing anything is somebody who can't be taught. 
Somebody who thinks that he knows everything, right? We've all had the misfortune to spend time with people like that, right? That they, they know everything, you can't tell them anything, they won't listen, it's, 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 it's pretty bad, right? <laughs> So here, what this, I think one of the things the Torah is trying to teach us over here is that it's, it's okay to be deficient. It's okay to be imperfect. Of course, we want to work on trying to, you know, to plug up the holes and to be less deficient and to move on and to grow great and to grow bigger. But at the same time, we have to know that pitching for perfection is not really going to get you very far at all. Yeah, I'm sorry, you wanted to... In the example with the light switch and the third example of the person who was completely unaware and did it, um, but the fact that it was done, are there, wouldn't there be spiritual repercussions the same as if the, at, at the um, city of refuge, one committing manslaughter beyond his control, it's something he, he just, he didn't do anything to prompt or to incriminate him, but it was done. Um, there are spiritual no. repercussions. It's, it's, you know, it's in, of course, yeah, yeah, for sure there are spiritual repercussions. But it's interesting, even in the case of manslaughter, there are definitely occasions where a person may kill somebody else and not have to go to the city of refuge. Oh. Which means if, if you are completely, you, there, there is, you, know, you didn't do anything untoward whatsoever. I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example which might make, it make some sense, but for example, in, in, today's, in today's, you know, today's environment, if somebody rushes out into the street and gets knocked down, so who's responsible? The person who rushed out into the street. I mean, it's true that the person driving the car was one who killed him, but it wasn't true that the person driving the car was doing exactly what he was supposed to do. He didn't do anything that he wasn't supposed to do. I'm not talking about somebody who's walking across a you know, walkway or somebody who's crossing on a green light uh, you know, uh, uh, when the, the traffic light is red and he's crossing. And, you, and We're not talking about that. We're talking about something which is really beyond the control of the person who did it. So in a case like that, then even, even according to Allah, in a case like that, the person wouldn't have to go to the city of refuge. Which means like this, are there spiritual? There are always spiritual repercussions, right? When somebody, somebody loses their life, of course there's going to be spiritual repercussions that we can't even begin to, you know, we can't really begin to, to measure over here. But the, the physical dimensions are going to be measured according to what happened. Who are you, right? So going back to the idea of the light. HaKadosh Baruch, it's true, the light has now been switched on on Shabbos by a Jew, right? Has that got a spiritual repercussion to it? Of course it does. But speaking in, in, in terms that we can relate to. Can God now confront that person and say, why did you switch the light on on Shabbos when the person had no idea that there's a concept of not switching on the lights on Shabbos? No. What the rabbis do say is that what God will confront the person with is, why did you never, why did you never investigate? Why did you never go to, to you know, try to find out who you are and what your heritage is? That's something else, which means like this, <laughs> that, that when, it, when, it come, when it comes to answering, accounting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will never ask you to account for something that you're not accountable for. Right, Nachamal, again, person has no idea that he's not supposed to put the light on on Shabbos. You ca God cannot then say to him, why did you do that? Because the answer is obvious. The answer is, I never knew. The one but, that didn't know. Not, uh, you know, wasn't aware. Are you comparing him to the four sons? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. He's a She'eni from one of the four sons in the, in the Haggadah on, on Pesach night. And he's somebody, what do you mean he's She'eni Yodei What does that mean? It means that he's, he's so ignorant that he doesn't why? even know that he's supposed to be asking about why what's why going would, on. Why would he be punished? He's not punished. Uh, but spiritually something. No, no, no. Again, what? No. Sorry, again, he's not, he can't, he's not going to be punished for putting on the light because that's not something which was a part of his, his, uh, his, right. his understanding at all. What he will be held accountable for is the fact that he never investigated. Which HaKadosh Baruch is saying like this, you know, there are only a limited amount of loopholes over here to get out of our responsibility. The question is, what are you being held responsible for? Right? There's, a, there's, an, incre you know, there's an incredible medrash. The medrash says like this, that Eliyahu Novi, Elijah, 
once came across a, a fisherman. See, on the, you know, ne next, to, next to the beach. So a Jewish fisherman, right? So he says to him, you know, what do you do? He says, I'm a fisherman. He says, do you learn? He says, no, I don't learn. I don't learn Torah. So Eliyahu Novi says to him, why not? So the fellow says, I have the perfect excuse to give God. No, don't worry about it. I've got it all worked out. So Eliyahu Novi says to him, really? Here, let's pretend. I'll be God. You be you. you do, what, what's, your, what, what's your reason? So he says, I'll tell you the truth. He says, I'm a pretty stupid guy. God made me stupid. So what, you know, what does he want? He, he wants me to sit down and learn Torah, but he never, he never gave me the ability to be able to do it. So I, I'm off the hook. <coughs> I guess, pun intended, he was a fisherman, right? <laughs> so uh, so uh, Eliyahu Novi says, wow, he says, that. that's, a, that's a pretty compelling argument. That's pretty good. And then he says to tell me, he says, oh, to be a fisherman, what do you have to do? So the fellow says, well, look, I'll tell you the truth. You know, being a fisherman, it's a pretty complex thing. You, you've got to buy flax, and then you have to weave nets. And the nets, the holes in the nets, they can't be too big and they can't be too small because if they're too big, then the fish will get through them. And if they're too small, then you'll catch the fish you don't want to catch. And then when, once you've got your net, you've got to take them out in the boat and you've got to find the place in the sea where you imagine the fish are going to be. And then you've got to drop the net down to the right level, to the right depth. And then you pull it in and then you've got to bring them back to the shore and then you can sell them. He says, you know, he says, I hope, you, I hope you're listening to what you say. He says, because the same person who gave you Seichel to be a fisherman is the same person who gave you Seichel to learn Torah. We imagine that in order to learn Torah, you need to have an IQ of, a, you know, 180, and, and uh, you've got to be brilliant, and you've got to have total recall, and if, you don't, if, you, if not, then it's just not worth it. It's not true. Learning Torah is something that we have to do. As much as we understand, we understand. But to sit and to study and to toil over learning Torah, that's something that everybody has to do. So that's a, that's a pretty compelling argument, right? When God says to the person who came up, who put on the light on Shabbos, and he never knew that there was Shabbos, and he never knew that you weren't allowed to put the light on, HaKadosh Baruch is not going to say to him, why did you transgress my Shabbos? He's just going to say to him, how come you never went out to learn about who you are? And that's a very, very powerful argument. You know, the Kotzke Rebbe, one of the great Hasidic Rebbe's used to say like this, it's true that ignorance is bliss. He says, but I prefer wisdom with the pain that comes together with it. I don't know, somehow, somehow inside of me I have this feeling that ignorance is bliss is something that many Jews are happy to apply to their spiritual lives, to their Jewish lives, but they would never ever do that in their professional lives, right? It's an excuse. Could you, could you imagine, you know, an, an accountant coming to work and, and not knowing anything about accountancy? Because, you know, if I did, then, you know, maybe I would have to be responsible for what I do. It's ridiculous, right? You ever, ever, seen, you ever heard of a surgeon who, you know, has a, has, the, uh, has the patient up on the table and he cuts open his stomach and then he sort of looks up and says, okay, what, what, what now? What, what, what is this? What's this tube over here? What does this do? Right? No. Why? How come? It's something, really, it's something, it's, it's really something quite extraordinary, the way that many, many Jews relate to Judaism, even though they're really very ignorant, or completely ignorant, but they've all got a, they've all got a, a say about what they feel, right? You know, again, can you imagine you've got this guy lying on the bed over there, and he's just been cut open, and you've got a world-class surgeon who's like poking around inside of him, pulling out bits and pieces, right? And the fellow's saying, oh, well, I don't, I don't think you should do that. I, I like that bit. Put it back in. When it comes to religion, though, so the unfortunate thing over here is what we're learning, is that you, you can be as ignorant as you want about your religious identity, but it's not going to help when you get upstairs. And believe me, when we get upstairs, at that point, you do not want to be in a state of ignorance. You really don't. You want to be able to say to a Kodesh Baruch I may not have done very much, but I did my best. I tried. I tried as hard as I could. You hear, you hear the difference, right? So let's say you're, you're stuck in the, you know, in, a, in, in, in the middle of nowhere in a university where there isn't very much Jewish life, and there isn't very much Jewish infrastructure. But you try. Don't always succeed, but you try. So for that, our Kodesh Baruch is going to be very happy, no? What made Shlomo Melech say that saying? 
What do you mean? What made him say it? He was giving giving parenting advice, right? It's, why, why would you, I mean, I don't know. Oh, so the the says like this. The verse says that every child should be taught according to who he right. is. The end of the pasuk is even more important than the beginning. The end of the pasuk says the, the end of the pasuk, The end of the verse says, "Gam ki yazkin lo yasor mimenu." That why why do we have to educate each child according to who they are? Because as each child gets wiser, he shouldn't abandon his Yiddishkeit. He shouldn't abandon his Judaism. Right? It's very, very important. Very, very important idea of it. It really is. Right? Yet what Shlomo Melech is teaching us is that the fundamental of Jewish education is not to get a degree. It's not to, you know, to, to, to take another test and get another exam and get another A and another 100%, but rather to invest in our children so that when they grow up, they'll be able to carry it on into the next generation that comes after them, which means that the, the importance of education, Jewish education, is, is not qualification. The importance of Jewish education is the ability to be able to carry it through from one generation to the next and then on to the next one afterwards. You know, when you stop and think about it for a moment, it, as far as we're concerned, every single person is a, it's a bridge between one generation and the next. And in order to be a bridge between one generation and the next, that means that you have to do what? You have to have the, the caliph, you have to have the ability to be able to take what you've been given and pass it over to the generation that come after you and pass it over in such a way that they can do the same thing. You hear? It's a responsibility. It really is a responsibility. But that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're here for. So, we, whatever. Okay, Peseda. Let, let, let's move on. 932. Um, chapter 36. Now, what's going to happen over here? If you remember, we're going to come across them right at the end of the passage, but if you, if you remember, we had these five daughters of Tzlovchad that they, wanted, they weren't married yet, and what was going to happen? They were going to be given a portion in the land of Israel. And what's going to happen to their portion, right? The tribes are now concerned. What are they concerned about? They're concerned that if these girls, girls, they were, they were ladies, they were in their 40s already, if they receive a portion in the land of Israel and then they get married to somebody outside of the tribe of Manasseh, which is where they came from, then what's going to happen to their land? Their land will now be transferred to whoever they get married to. And then what's going to be? It won't belong to the tribe of Manasseh anymore. So the tribe of Manasseh, of course, is, is very, very concerned over here. So they come and they say, what's the problem? Everything's going to be given out according to a lottery. And Slavchad and his daughters, what's going to be by you? Lechab mi bnei shivte bnei Yisrael lenoshim v'nigra nachlas on mi nachlas avu yisenu v'noisaf al nachlas amate anshet tien lahem. We're concerned that these girls will get married to somebody outside of their tribe, and then what's going to be? Their nachla, their portion is going to go to the husband. Umigo nachlas eni yigarea, and the total land of the tribe of Manasseh is going to be reduced. It'll probably be even more complicated because it won't even be on the edge, it'll be in the middle somewhere, and all of a sudden, punk, you'll have pieces of land that don't belong to the, to the same tribe anymore. And what, what will happen? In the, in the end, everything is going to disappear from within our within our portion. So says Moshe like this, Vayitzav Moshe es b'nei Yisrael al pi Hashem leimor. The Moshe commanded the Jewish people al pi Hashem leimor, according to the word of God. Cain, mate b'nei Yosef doivrim, that the tribe of Yosef are speaking correctly. Yeah? I mean, Menashe's complaint is valid. Yeah. Right? This is the word that God commanded. What's Pshat? 
that HaKadosh Baruch is telling them that they need to get married. They should all get married. In Mitzvah Shem, they should find their Beshet, they should find their Zivug, and they should get married, but it should be from somebody within their own tribe. That the land shouldn't disappear. So Rav Gifta says like this. Go back to verse number 5. Let's try and read it through again, because there's something here a little bit incongruous. Vayitzav Moishes B'nei Sola Pi Hashem Leimor that this is what God is commanding the Jewish people. Then, says the verse, Cain, Mate, Vene Yosef, Doivrim, that the tribe of Joseph are speaking correctly. You know, I don't know, it doesn't sound quite right. Which means that God has commanded, right, God's made a command that you should marry within your own tribe, right? <clears throat> so what difference does it make whether it says Cain, where's it gone? Um, Cain, Mate, Bnei Yosef, Doivrim, that they're speaking correctly. That the halach has now been formulated, right? Which is, everybody here, you understand, what's the problem? The, verse, the verses that preceding this have just explained to us what happened. That the tribe of Manasseh came, they said they're very concerned, they don't know what's going to be, and then a Kodesh Bogu says, you know what, you guys are right. And then it says, Cain, Mate, Bnei Yosef, Doivrim, that they're speaking correctly. <laughs> But we know that. If God is ruling that this is what needs to be done, then we know that what they said is correct. I'll give this to something else altogether, which has got, it's not really, it's not really got anything to do with the practical application of the halacha over here. Rav Gifter is saying like this, Cain Matei B'nei Yosef Doivrim is a sign that even though God has ruled on a particular issue, we still need to try to work out why. Right? You hear what's going on? Most of the oral law, right? Mishnah and the Gemara. What's it taken up with? It's taken up with trying to understand why the halachas are the way that they are. You, you know, <laughs> if anybody here, if you're, if you're familiar with learning Gemara, so you'll know that invariably, after a Mishnah, what is a Mishnah? The Mishnah is the oral law. What is the Gemara? The Gemara is a discussion on the oral law. Right? So invariably, after the Mishnah, the first words of the Gemara very often are Menani Mili. How do they know that? How do the rabbis who formulated the halacha inside of the Mishnah, how do they know what they're saying? If you stop and think about it for a moment, that's a pretty, that's a pretty outrageous thing to say, isn't it? What do you mean? They're, they're formulating the Mishnah. What do you mean, how do they know what they're saying? So the Gemara is coming to teach us what? No, everything needs to have a source. Everything needs to be sourced back to where it, to where it needs to get to, right? So when they say Manani Mili, it's not like they're saying, oh, you know, how do you know that? But rather, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a question, it's a research question. How did they get to that conclusion? To help that person give an answer to where it Oh, so what, what's Pshat? How, how does it help me? to know where it comes from. And if you, if you can get back to Har Sinai, then that's, a, that's a, the, you know, the, the strongest proof that you can bring, right? So what, what's Pshat? How does it help me to know that? Because the more I know, and the more I understand, and the greater I see the way that something is built, the greater is my ability to appreciate what it is that I've been given. You know, if you're like me, I am mathematically challenged. No, it's official. Right? Don't look at me like that. I, I, don't, I don't mean you to, you know, to, feel, to think less of me than you already do, right? If such a thing is possible, but I'm, I'm mathematically challenged. I really am, along with all my other challenges. <laughs> That's one of them. So when I was in school, I never, took, I never understood this, really. When I was in, I always used, used to copy the answers from the person sitting next to me. So when we were learning how to do equations in school, yeah? You know, when you get given an equation, 80% of the mark is for the working out. The teacher wants to know that you understand how to do equations, right? 20% is for the answer. You get the answer right, that's good. If you don't get it right, even, but if, you, if, your, if your logic is good, you'll get 80% of the marks. You won't get 100% because you didn't get to the right answer. Me, being the lazy kid that I was and being mathematically challenged, I didn't have time or inclination to, when I was busy cheating, right, to copy everything that he was writing down over there. So I just copied the answer, that's all. And I never understood. This guy, who I said, he was good, this guy I said next to him. He came out with 100% and I would come out with 20%. And I think the teacher knew perfectly well that I was probably cheating off him. I'm, 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 sure, I'm sure the teacher knew. 
know, on the rare occasion when he got the answer wrong, it meant that I got the answer wrong as well. The only difference is that I had no idea why I got the answer wrong. <laughs> but at least I was consistent. So I didn't know why I got the answer right either. Hey, you hip shot. We're, we're being taught in math, right? We're being taught how to deal with any problem that might arise later on, which doesn't come in the standard mathematical formula of an equation. It's giving us a little bit of life skills, right? Which either you pick up or you don't. That's exactly what our gift is saying over here. Akkadish Bokh was saying like this. In Halach, it's the same thing. Akkadish Bokh could have told us here, here's a list of what you can do and here's a list of what you can't do and just do it. Right? But that's not enough. Akkadish Bokh wants us to plumb the depth of what's going on. He wants us to understand why we're doing. He wants us to recognize how to formulate. To be able to formulate halacha, you have to know how halacha came into being to begin with, right? Otherwise, how can you get up and say, in you know, today's modern age that we live in, so how can you get up and say that something which does not appear in the Torah in any place or any form whatsoever, that it's okay to do on Shabbos or it's not okay to do on Shabbos, how can you do that? The only way that you can do it is by understanding how, formula, how, how, formu, how formulating halacha works. If I know how to formulate halacha, then I am capable of being able to work out what the halacha for something is, even if I don't know and I can't find a source for what's going on in the standard classic sources. Rav Hortner says like this, <coughs> you know, Torah the, the written Torah is what? The written Torah is a skeleton. You can't understand the written Torah without the oral Torah. So says Rav Hutner, what's the oral Torah? The Mishnah, right? Says Rav Hutner, if that's the case, then the Mishnah should be something which is absolutely crystal clear. Right? If the whole function of the Mishnah is to, to explain the Torah should be chsav, the, the, the written Torah, to explain it fully and clearly, then every Mishnah should be 100% crystal clear. And yet we all know that's not true, right? Anyone who's ever learned the very first Mishnah in the, in the whole of Shas, <coughs> the whole of the Talmud, begins with a question. And then a whole discussion about, you know, when do you read the Shema in the evening? <coughs> there are three different options that are given. No, it's supposed to be clear, right? It's supposed to be something which we, that, that, that's going to spell it out for us in such a way that we don't have to worry. So says Rav Hulot, the most incredible idea over here. He says, the first thing a person needs to learn when they come to learn Torah is that without a Rebbe, they can't know. And how does your Rebbe know what he knows? From his Rebbe. And how does his Rebbe know what he knows? From his Rebbe, till you get to where? Until you get back to Har Sinai. Torah is not something which is just being created out of nowhere. Torah is something which has been created out of something which exists already, something which was given to us by HaKadosh Baruch Hu on Har Sinai. And now we have to work out how we're going to, how we're going to use it, how we're going to formulate it. Says Rav Gifta, that that's a pshara with Cain, Mate, Bnei Yosef, Doivrim. You know what, guys? These guys, they're speaking, they're speaking good, you know that? That's what he's saying, yeshivish. He said good. But well, what does uh, Joseph come in? Because Menashe is part of Yosef. Yeah, right, okay, that, that's okay. But you hear, you hear pshat. So you say to yourself, hold on a second. Cain, Matei, Bnei Yosef, Doivrim, they're speaking good. Why are they speaking good? That needs to be your question. Why? What's the, why, why are they speaking good? Why does it make sense what they're saying? What difference would it make if the land went off into a different, in, into a different tribe? Why can't they get married to whoever they want to get married to? And then you start investigating, and then the more you investigate, the, the smarter you become, the more wise you become, and the greater is your ability to understand Torah better, that's all. And they meant to say that the question is correct. Yeah, it's like I got, but uh, again, what Rav Gifter is saying is that the phrase is superlative. <coughs> Obviously, if God is ruling according to what they're asking about, then what they're saying is correct. Otherwise, there's nothing to ask about. Um, yeah. I'd just like to point out, when they requested to spy out the land, um, they weren't declined that request. Right. And neither were they said, oh, what you're saying is good. Yeah. In fact, Hashem would have preferred not to have that happen, but he went ahead and said yeah. to, to Moshe, Shlach you, lecha, you do it. You want to do it, you do it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's more of like, not just a way of investigation, it's more of a way of assurance, reassurance that what you're 
what you're doing is legitimate. What you're asking is legitimate. Whereas for the spies, they're... they're oh, just, maybe. That's an interesting idea. Okay. Maybe. Right? Which means that over here, it's like a Kodesh Baruch who wants to assure them... It's like, it's like his own approval. Absolute approval. You know what? Good. That's a nice idea. Right? That, uh, that instead of, instead of uh, you know, <laughs> maybe there's a, a concern that people would be scared to come forward mm -hmm. and to question... Because look, look what happened back then, right? So our Kodesh Baruch is reassuring them, and he's saying, "No, no, it's it's a great question. The the only it's a nice it's a nice explanation. The only thing is that if that were the case, then perhaps the beginning of the perhaps the, the end of the verse should be at the beginning and not at the end, which is perhaps God needs to preface everything by saying, Cain, Matebene Yosef Torim.' You know what these guys are saying? Good, and here this is what we're going to do." But for some reason over here, they switch it around. God says that this is what we're going to do, right? And, they, they, you know, these guys are speaking good. They're, they're saying good. You know what? Good. It's a nice idea. Here, let's flip over the page. Let's get to the end of the passage. Right? The idea is that the tribes are supposed to stay within their own sort of tribal limits. HaKadosh is saying that if a, if a woman inherits from her father, again, like Slavchad, he had no sons, right? So what's, what's going to happen over here? His daughters are going to inherit. But if his daughters inherit, then they need to get married to people within their own tribe to make sure that the land stays within the tribe. Now, I have to understand something. We're, we're, the last part of the whole of Sefer Bamidbar, this is the last verses in the whole of the book of Bamidbar, and this is what we're really finishing the Torah in a certain way, it's finishing over here because in Mitzvah Hashem next week we'll talk about the, the status of Devarim, Sefer Devarim, what, what it really is. But <clears throat> the Torah ends with Benois Tzlovchad, with the daughters of Tzlovchad. This is the third time that they're being mentioned. They're mentioned twice in Pasha's Pinchas, and they're being mentioned over here as well. And not only are they being mentioned over here, but the Torah, the Sefer Bamidbar, is ending with Benois Tzlovchad, which means there's something very, very significant over here. The Tiena, Machla, Tirza, Vachogo, Milka, Venoya, Benois Tzlovchad, Livnei, Doi, Dehen, Noshim. So here, <clears throat> first of all, I don't expect anybody over here to be following this carefully. But every single time that the daughters of Tzlovchad are mentioned, they're mentioned in a different order. Twice. In Pinchas and once a week. In Pinchas we've got Tirza, Venoya, Chogla, Milka, Umachla. And then the second time they're mentioned in Pasha's Pinchas, it says Tirza, Umilka, the Chogla, Umachla, Noya. And then we've got Noya, Milka, the Chogla, Umachla, Tirza. So the Gemara, the Gemara is intrigued about all of this. Right? It's, a, it's a Gemara. It's, where, where's the Gemara? The Gemara is in, uh, in Bob Basra. Why, why is the order being changed around? Right on top of that, the Emma says, if you, look, if you look very carefully, you'll see that the Vov, some of, some of the names have got a Vov and some of them don't. And, right? Here, so, so Tirza, the Chogla, U Milka, the Noya. But in, in the other places, the Vovs appear in, in a different order. <clears throat> so the Gemara Bob Vassar says like this, that the first time they come, it's in order of Chochmah. The order that's given over. They're coming to ask a great big kasha over here, a kasha that Moshe Rabbeinu himself is not able to answer, and it has to be answered by God. Right? So the order that's given the first time around is to do with their Chochmah. Who's, who's the smartest one there? Over here it's talking according to their age, because over here it's to do with marriage. Right? They should get married according to their ages. Right? However, there's another explanation which is given, which is that they were all completely equal. And when you're equal, it makes no difference what order you appear in. And the Torah is coming to be emphasized, right? If they appeared in the same order every single time, then that would seem to, it, that would seem to indicate there was some kind, of a, some kind of a hierarchy over here. Right? However, if they appear each time in a different order, what it's coming to say is that each one was equal. They were all as righteous as each other. The Emma says, I don't know if you, if you remember this stuff, but uh, Moshe and Aaron 
very often it sometimes it sometimes it says Moshe for Aaron, sometimes it says Aaron for Moshe. And Rashi himself says, why why is the order switched around from time to time to teach that they were equal to each other? Right? In, in their task within the Jewish people, right, in the, they, they were equal to each other, which means that we hear the same kind of idea that they're equal to each other in their righteousness. One last idea, and then we'll see why, in, in all events, we're still, we're still stuck with this. Why, why does Sefer Bamidba end with this? Why is this the last thing? And then Chazak, Chazak, it's a very poignant moment when you finish a whole book, right? And in Mitzvah Shem next week, we'll start a new one. It's all, it's all very, you know, these are very, very poignant moments. So the question over here is why? So the, in the Medrash, it says like this. I think I mentioned this actually when we spoke about Benoit Sofra, but it's worth hearing it again. Moshe Rabbeinu was married and he separated from his wife in order to be able to receive prophecy from God the whole time that they were in the desert. <coughs> Moshe Rabbeinu, at the end of his life, maybe there's a, just a little tiny concern that he may think to himself, you know what, I was, I was pretty righteous. You know what, I, I, I'm, that's pretty self, self... Can you say self-sacrificial? I don't know. That's like a big self-sacrifice, right? To, to separate from my wife in order to be able to lead the Jewish people and in order, right? That's... HaKadosh Baruch in order to remove any, any possibility whatsoever that Moshe might have a tiny trace of being prideful about what he did, he brings him Benoist Tzlovchod, who none of them are married. They're in their 40s already. They're not married yet because they haven't yet found husbands who are as righteous as they are. It's as if a Kodesh Baruch who's saying to Moshe Rabbeinu, listen, my friend, you separated from your wife, but you know what you got when you separated from your wife? You got, a, you got a, an open communication with me, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It's probably worth it, no? These girls over here, they didn't get anything out of what they did. They just, they're waiting in order to find suitable partners, people on the same spiritual level that they're on, in order to be able to build their homes together with, you know what? If you, if you think you did good, right? They did even better than you. And that's why it appears over here. When it appeared in Pasha's Pinchas, it's not a question because, you know, that's the way that things unfolded, the chronology. They need to know what's going to be. But over here, why is it being repeated again? In order, at the end, the very end of Moshe Rabbeinu's life, to teach him that to be righteous 24 hours a day, seven days a week, without getting anything particularly, you know, out of it, that's something which is very difficult to do. And in the Medrash it says that the, 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 uh, the daughters of Tzlovchad, in the merit of their waiting and in the merit of their, of their being so righteous, they found within their own tribe, they each one found their husband and they all established beautiful homes with righteous children. But they all had to be from the same Shevet. The yeah, they wanted to come from Shevet Menashe. They would have gone to another show and marry somebody. That's it. Then. And the lamb would have gone. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So chazak, chazak, benit chazak. It's Hashem. We should all be strong. The Jewish people should be strong. Right. The right. land of Israel should be strong. The soldiers that are defending us should be strong. It's Hashem. We should only share good news together. Right. And it's Hashem. We're going to stop over here. Everyone should have a Shabbat Shalom. It should be a wonderful Shabbos. It's Hashem. It should be a, an uneventful Shabbos. How about that? And uh, Mitzvah Shem will meet up as always over here Sunday morning. Mm -hmm.